Hello and welcome to this installment of Conquering My Collection. It's been a while since the last one, so if you're unfamiliar with this series, this is a series in which I simply pick a Blu-ray from my collection that I haven't seen before, watch that film for the first time and give you my thoughts afterwards. Very casual movie vlog type series. And this is actually going to be a break from the norm. Usually I pick a, a Blu-ray that I've had in my collection for quite a while, one I've been meaning to get to, something like that. But this is a Blu-ray that turned up today. So I don't think I've ever bought a Blu-ray and then on the day watched it, um, for this series at least, and even then it's a rare thing for me to do to actually <laughs> buy a film and then watch it that day, um, which is probably one of my big weaknesses as a collector and a film lover, I think, is I buy all these films I want to watch and I don't really tend to get to them right away. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm always one of those like scatterbrained people who has a lot of things going on, there's always stuff to, to work on and watch, and so it just yeah, it never really works out, but tonight, I'm going to break the mold just a little bit because this is a film I'm really excited to check out. I only heard about it about two weeks ago, I think. My local cinema is showing it in a couple of weeks' time, and I thought, eh, I looked at the synopsis, and it was like, maybe, you know, but probably not. <laughs> and then I saw that Graham over at Man V Film had put a review up for the film. I thought, okay, that's interesting. He reviewed the film. I think I saw him maybe tweet something positive about it as well. And then, I don't know where I first saw this, but I became aware of what this film actually is. I should show you what the bloody thing is. It is Bait, a film by Mark Jenkin. So this is a, a brand new release. The Blu-ray just came out, I think, a week or two ago. And it's a 2019 film. It came out last summer. And it's a British movie. And it is quite unique in that it is shot on a vintage 16mm camera, hand-cranked, I believe. Uh, on 16mm black and white film stock and then all the sound is done in post sync. So it has the appearance of a very old movie and the, the, the aspect ratio is in square frame, you know, the, the kind of one, is it 133 to 1? Yeah, it should say on the back, 133 to 1. So it looks like an old movie and then it just so happened the BAFTAs were last night, I was watching it and, and Connie was kind of perking up, like, that looks like an old movie. And it, the, the look of it and the feel of it is very interesting. Even the sound sounds old. And it's about a, a group of Cornish fishermen, I believe. But I'm, I'm certainly drawn in by the gimmick, <laughs> you know, and I just thought, oh, I want to see that. And I, I saw the Blu-ray was on Amazon. I thought, you know what, I, I want to watch that tomorrow. So I ordered it with Prime, turned up today, very timely, and I'm going to check it out now. Interestingly enough, for Blu-ray collectors, the BFI seem to have switched to a a full um, sleeve um, layout for their cases. Of course, usually you have the clear Blu-ray logo at the top, um, like most Blu-rays, but this is like kind of like a Criterion case. And I did read a while ago that they've changed this format now, which I think maybe some people who have all of their labels in one place and like things to be uniform might not appreciate this change, but I'm for it. It looks pretty cool, but I'm really intrigued to see what this film is like and how it plays out and if it rises above the gimmick. Now, when I was about 20, I was daydreaming as you normally do. If you if you like making videos on films, that is, you will definitely have daydreamed of being a director and making your own movies. And one of the things I, I thought would be so cool to do would be to make a movie uh, set in the 1980s, for example. It doesn't have to be the 1980s, but uh, in my head, I'm thinking it would be a film set in the 80s, but you would make it with a camera that was used in the 80s and on film stock that was used in the 1980s and maybe those things don't even exist anymore but the idea of it and using the same equipment and trying to get that same feel without using modern equipment and that seems to essentially be what a bait is it's using older equipment um, to kind of get a different aesthetic an older aesthetic and one that we've seen before in older kind of scrappier looking films but I'm just really intrigued to see if the gimmick will distract or add to the, the kind of the, the, the tone and the vibe of the film. Uh, many people have made films in 133 to 1 aspect ratio in, in black and white and it does have a very striking look and you compose the image in a much different way than in a widescreen film so I'm really intrigued to see how this holds up. The one thing I'm almost trepidatious about even though it, it kind of got me even more interested in watching this film is the fact that Mark Commode who is a critic in the UK that I, I, really, um, I really like his um, takes on films he has said that this is his film of the year for 2019, and this is his film of the decade. Now, a film that's released in the last six months of the last year of the decade being someone's film of the decade feels a little bit like a hot shot kind of move, you know, kind of like, well, it's the flavor of the month. But then I realized that 
<laughs> There's an audio commentary on this Blu-ray with the director Mark Jenkin and Mark Commode. Okay. Uh, there's also a special feature. There's a 33-minute Q&A with Mark Jenkin in conversation with Mark Commode. And then on the front cover it says a genuine modern masterpiece. Mark Commode. And it just it feels a bit weird to me where it's like, is the film critic getting a little bit too close to the, the sun here? I don't know. It just seems like, okay, he loves this film. And now he's doing the commentary on it, and I don't know. Like, the first thing I thought of was Roger Ebert doing a commentary for Casablanca, but that's like a film that was released decades and decades ago. This just, it feels like a weird thing. I don't know. And I like Mark, Mark Commode. I like him talking about films. I'm sure I will enjoy the audio commentary if I decide to listen to it, but it just seemed like, oh, Mark Commode loves it. That's, that's interesting. Oh, wait, he's all over this Blu-ray. <laughs> like, he's really, <laughs> you know, loving this film. So that part intrigues me. It drew me in, and at the same time, it almost pushes me away, so I'm just intrigued by that in general. But anyway, uh, the stacked release as well, actually. The Blu-ray has, like, a bunch of short films that Mark Jenkin, the director, has made in the in the past few years. It also has um, some, like, really old films. And that's one thing I love about BFI is they always try and sneak in these extras that are, like, these classic British films. Like, one of them's from, like, 1912. Uh, an early visual record of Cornwall, uh, Great Western Railway sponsored tour visits, um, Newquay, Truro, Falmouth. So, like an interesting look at you know, it, I don't know what the area is in Cornwall where this is set, but you know th those general areas like how they've been represented on old British films. There's a 1936 film called The Saving of Bill Blewett, a uh, docudrama that sees two Cornish fishermen managing to save enough money to replace their boat after it's lost at sea. So. Really cool extras, I have to say, and then obviously you have the audio commentary with the director and the um, the Q and A and all that kind of stuff. So really cool release. I just hope the film lives up to it. So let's check it out. Okay, it is now very late, early hours of the morning. Uh, I actually watched another film after Bait. Um, I, I couldn't just speak about it straight away. I needed time to process it and read some reviews and uh, actually watch some of the special features on the desk first because I don't know. It, maybe I should have. Maybe I should have before I read reviews and so on and so forth. But I needed some time to process this. A few hours at least before I started talking about it. Uh, but yeah, Bates. It's an interesting one. It's certainly a film. <laughs> so where do I even start? Where do I even start? It's it's a very strange and different <laughs> film. I can't even speak about it. Uh, I can, I just don't even know where to begin. There's so much to get into. I did watch the 30-minute uh, Q&A recorded at the BFI in July of 2019 with Mark Commode and the uh, writer-director Mark Jenkin. And I assume also the director of photography because he was filming the whole thing on this. Um, there, there's a name for the camera. Uh, a vintage 16mm camera uh, which is from 1976 I think so it's a really old camera using monochrome Kodak film stock 16mm uh, you know only like two minutes plus per roll so very limiting in terms of how much you can shoot and then of course film is, is, is very expensive um, at least compared to digital you know if you're filming a scene with actors you can set up a digital camera, you can record for hours, no worries. To do that with that amount of freedom with film would be unimaginably expensive. So <laughs> time is money with film. So it must have been quite difficult. And I think maybe that's where some of the flaws in the film really come to light in terms of the, I think, the acting. 
I think that uh, on the Q&A, uh, Jenkins said that they would do one take of a scene and then one more for safety and that was it. So not a lot of time to refine the performances. He didn't really talk about the acting and working with the actors. So I don't know if rehearsal was a big part of the, the pre-production of this film. But there's certainly stilted moments with the actors. But part of that also seemed to, to run with the eerie and strange atmosphere and ambience of the film itself as well. And then on top of that is a whole other layer, a layer of um, unease, I think, and distance with the, the sound, which is all done after the fact. It's post-synced, you know, uh, filming on a camera like this. The sound is, you know, it would be unusable to kind of get to get the sound on the, the actual, it's all part of the, the process of it, like the actual 16 millimeter film, uh, I don't think uh, could retain sound, something like that, but also the sound of the camera. And also he talks about how it kind of gave, gave him freedom in terms of building the sound mix completely from the ground up. You know, there's no removing this from that shot and that, removing that from that shot because there's no sound, it's a silent film. And then you build it all up from again from the ground up and then the performances come in he did a version of the film where he did all the dialogue and he was even editing the film uh while kind of lip reading what the <laughs> what the lines were to get the rhythm of all the it, it sounds really complicated and a huge ball ache not least of all the fact that he processed the film all himself in his own studio which took three months um so it's an incredible undertaking but as i was saying you know, the performances only being given one take, two takes, and then you have to do the dialogue after the fact. There's a, there's a weird distance to it. It's a weird, eerie vibe that comes across through the performances. And so you have the dialogue coming in. Even the dialogue, the way that the sound is recorded, sounds uh, as, as ropey as the film looks. I don't know if that was intended, actually. He didn't really talk about the sound in the Q&A. I really want to listen to the audio commentary, actually. If there's any more technical information, I'd be really interested, especially the sound. But... You know, it, it's it's like the voices are slightly separated from the the physical realm, and uh, but it's and then you have the Cornish accents. You know, what's on? You know, <laughs> I'm so glad the film had subtitles because there's certain bits of slang that just uh, eluded me, like the what's on, you know, and what's going on, what's what's on, and you know, and then uh, I suppose bloody and bloody, you can kind of get the gist of that. But yes, yeah, subtitles were very helpful in this case. But yeah, the performances are odd. Uh, the main actor who plays uh, our main character, Martin, Edward Rowe, was really good, actually. He's, he's such a... He has a face for cinema, you know. But, but I think even just the way film looks, uh, and especially this film, I don't know, there's something fucking magical about it, you know. And I almost think anyone's face would look great in, in, kind of, in this kind of a film. I don't just the focus and the... The raw grain of the film, the texture of it, you know. Uh, there's just something special about the way film looks, I think. But this guy's face, I mean, it's such... It's There's so much history etched onto that face and that beard. And, you know, it, it's an expressive face, even when he's not really expressing anything at all. It's just a very stoic, weathered, and kind of, you know... You feel like a life has gone on behind those eyes and under that beard. And... Uh, so yeah, it's kind of captivating just seeing him on screen, I think, but, uh, and then his very gruff demeanor and uh, his attitude. The story is really interesting. Uh, he plays a character who uh, used to be a fisherman on a boat, but uh, now he doesn't have a boat, so he essentially kind of does what he can. He puts nets out on the beach and kind of, you know, these, um, I forget what they're called, but they're like uh, little boxes that he'll lower into the sea and then tie to like a, a, a chain and then pull the you know the kind of boxes out after the fact to try and catch lobster and fish and he goes door to door selling these fish and it's kind of about industry and the way that it's kind of dying out in some way especially like the kind of homegrown you know local fisherman that kind of thing and there's a, a whole storyline with his brother who he's slightly estranged from and I find it kind of sweet how the, the main character, uh, Martin, I forget his brother's name, but, um, you know, Martin is very disapproving of his brother using their boat to now ferry tourists out on the, on, onto the, you know, with, he's not using the boat as a fishing boat anymore, he's using it to 
to uh, cater to tourism in the area, which uh, Martin feels like, you know, he feels like that the tourism is kind of killing the area in a way. There's a family who've moved into his house that he had to sell. And, you know, they've, they've kind of put all this nautical stuff in there that isn't being used practically, it's there for effect. And they've opened up this kind of, you know, part of the house for um, people to come and stay in, you know, so it's kind of a business for them as well. And, you know, th th there's a constant friction between Martin and this family who've moved into his house and, and bought it from him. There's a scene where, you know, they're like, um, we didn't have to buy this house from you. And he's like, didn't you? You know, th there's, there's, there's so much unsaid and kind of a backstory that isn't really uh, expanded upon very much, but it doesn't need to be. And it is a film where the, the, the way that the characters interact and the, the who's who and, and, you know, like, what are the relationships here, it very much rewards your attention if you keep up. Because at the beginning, you're like, who's this, who's that, you know, and there's not a lot of exposition there in terms of setting up those relationships. It just, it comes naturally, but then also there are these flash-forward moments where just, just, there'll be a guy on the floor you know, just, just like with his head back and it's in the middle of a scene that has is completely removed to context. And you're like, what the fuck is going on here? Suddenly there's a, a police car and it's night and then we're back to the daytime again. Uh, there are moments where we cross cut between characters doing certain things, whether it's Martin working and doing manual labor and then cutting to, you know, the woman who's bought his house and is now kind of preparing food, you know, uh, and bringing in food from outside of, you know, the area. There's such certain moments of social commentary in that sense, again, with the tourism and the industry and how they're clashing and how maybe the way of life of fishermen is dying out. There's this other fisherman character who is a great, um, he's a great character in terms of just his face. You know, there's not much uh, meat to his actual character in terms of who he is in the story and the plot or whatever as a character, but just seeing that kind of weathered face to, to a much higher degree than Martin just, just the shots of him just looking at people, you know, I don't know, there's something about an old face that really has so much, um, there's no other word for it, character. So I think his character, the, the old fisherman is kind of like, he's almost just standing there, you know, he, we never really see him fishing, I don't think, he's just kind of there, almost as this kind of, you know, quasi-static monument to the way things used to be. You know, he walks around and stuff, but he's not really doing anything, uh, at least from memory. That's how, what I kind of view his character as, is it's this kind of monument to what the, the old ways used to be. And the fact that he's still alive and around means that there's still some of that there, but it's, it's, it's kind of on its last legs at the same time. And so Martin's brother seems to be moving with the times and kind of... Um, uh, appeasing the, the tourism that's coming into the area by using the boat to kind of, you know, ferry people around. But Martin is, he wants to kind of stick to the, the fishing. But I like the, the brother's relationship because you can tell it's strained. At one point, Martin says, like, you know, our old man would be spinning in his grave if he saw what you'd become and, and why you're not fishing and, and all this and stuff. It's disgusting. It's disgraceful. So their relationship is very strained. And even though he says these things to his brother, his brother still says still says to him, I'll leave that one in for free. He still says, you're welcome anytime you want to, to come back and work on the boat. But Martin doesn't want to, you know, uh, work with the, these tourists. And these tourists are painted to be kind of, you know, kind of idiots in a sense. But also how every day Martin comes home with a plastic bag with a fish in it and he leaves it on his brother's kind of door and it's kind of not a peace offering but it's kind of like this this constant that he uh, ritual in a way that he kind of does every day even though you know things are very strained with his brother and he doesn't agree with what his brother is doing he still kind of you know brings him a fish at the end of the day and so there's something kind of sweet about that and those little gestures paint in more than certain dialogue could, or at least they paint it in a more subtle and interesting way than dialogue would, I think. And certainly in this film, there's not a lot of dialogue. I mean, there is and there isn't, but compared to a regular film, I would say the dialogue ratio is probably a lot lower. And the editing style is very strange. As I said, it, it, you have these flash forwards that you don't even realize are flash forwards, and then as you get towards the end of the film, you get these flash forwards that you think are going to pay off and then they just don't. And it's very um, poetic and 
confusing as well, you know, uh, and certainly like at the beginning of the film, uh, there's a shot where Martin's walking towards the, the fishing boat and suddenly we cut to like a low angle of the floor and just his feet and then it cuts back again and it felt very amateur to me. It felt like an angle I would try and get if I was like 15, like, oh, let's get, get a shot of his foot as he's walking. Like it was very quick and just felt not refined, I don't know. But then as the film progressed, that was the style, that was... You know, there's so many close-ups and random cutaways, and Jenkins was talking in the Q&A about how he would never open a roll of film with something important um, in case there were any issues with the you know, the piece of the roll of film that he was using, so he'd always open it with a random cutaway. And these would be things he wasn't even planning, you know, he'd be where he was for the scene, okay, putting a new roll in, I'll, I'll get a close-up of that bottle, you know, and then there's five seconds left on the film, I'll get a random shot of, of this, all that, and then use them. He didn't want to waste any film, so he would, he would kind of put these shots in here and there, and I think that it actually works quite well, and it felt very, the editing and, and, and the uses of close-ups felt very silent era to me, um, the first thing I thought of was Battleship Potemkin, uh, Sergei Eisenstein's film. I haven't seen any other films from Eisenstein, actually, I don't think, but just that kind of Soviet <laughs> silent editing, certainly. I'm now thinking of um, uh, Turk Sib or Turk Saib. I don't know how you pronounce that, but the, the, the great documentary about the um, Siberian railway being constructed in the 1920s. And just yeah it's almost this very it's not expressionistic what is it it's um, experimental perhaps i don't know almost avant-garde just the again the flash forwards the flashback shots you know and and, and it's you know, usually when you think of a flash forward you think of like okay now we go ahead and there's a scene that that hasn't happened yet in the main narrative of the film but we're, i'm talking like two second shots maybe one second shots of things that have yet to happen you know, boom, there you go, and no context whatsoever, and then maybe towards the, you know, the middle of the film or the end of the film, those things will come back around again. It's, it's very different and hard to follow at times, but also engaging because there's always something happening, even though there, at times there are just stretches where it's Martin just, you know, unraveling his fishing net, and it's very mundane, but there are these really stunning shots of the landscape and the sky and the clouds and the, 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 the film stock is constantly, it's all over the place. It's never consistent. And uh, Mark Commode asked Jenkin in the Q&A, did you intentionally like make the film, you know, uh, weathered and damaged to add to the effect? And he, and he said, no, I never tried to make it more than what it was. All you see on the final film is just the result of me trying to hand process it myself. So it wildly fluctuates. Maybe some of the contrast is different. Um, there's you know, hair in, in, in kind of the, the film or there's scratches or uh, it'll, it'll kind of flicker into negative at times. There's a, a shot of the fish that he leaves for his brother in a plastic bag on the door handle and it's just kind of, uh, kind of fleckled, fleckled? That's not even a word. Um, it's like flex. Flex, is that even a word? I don't know. These little, little tiny... Um, Specks, speckled, is speckled, maybe speckled was the word I was thinking of, but it's almost like a star field of just these random dots on the image, and he talked about that in the q and I, I, that was a, a shot that really stood out, I just thought, what is that damage on the film, and he thinks that it was um, that particular roll of film, he was hanging it up to dry, and he left the door to the studio open, and he, he thinks it was pollen that came in and is now ingrained in the film forever, so you kind of have to roll with it, and... I really like the way it looks because it, it reminds you of an old film and, and it feels like out of its time, but then it's very much a modern film. You can see it in the cars and things here and there, but there are certain shots where there isn't anything that's that's touched by, you know, mod... It, it's mod... <laughs> I'm, gonna try, see, I'm, I'm trying to be clever with my words here and it's not quite working out. I was going to say, and there, aren't, there are some shots that aren't touched with mod... <laughs> I'm gonna leave this in for free. Modernity is that even a mo modern modernity? They're gonna word modern with itty on the end. I I don't think that's a word, is it? I feel like I want to check that just to kind of be a, a real knob, because I feel like that's a word, or maybe I'm just saying it wrong or or whatever. Let me try and get Google up on my um. And now I'm actually realizing how bloody late it is and how much I'm rambling about this film. 
uh, which is not not good. But the, the, I guess all I can say is that there are some shots where there's nothing modern in them. I should just say that. I should just stop being a wanker and just say what I want to say and not try and sound clever. Um, but admittedly, here I am trying to find out if modernity is a word. <laughs> but there are some shots in the film where it's untouched by anything modern, and you could you could buy it being a film shot in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 40s, you know, um, especially given the fact that I don't recognize really any of the, um, any of the actors, really. Um, modernity, the quality or condition of being modern, an aura of technological modernity. It's a, it doesn't roll off the tongue, modernity. I don't know. You know, when you think of a word too much, it just loses all meaning. So, there are some shots in the film that are untouched by modernity. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you feel like you're watching something that's outside of time, in a way. Especially in a fishing town where things are completely modern anyway, but... Uh, God, there's just so much to talk about. There is so much to talk about. It should be like a, a three-parter or something. Um... But I loved, I loved the feeling of it, obviously being 131 to 1 aspect ratio, it just feels like something that could have been made in, a, in another time. But then it isn't, and, and, and you know it's not, and there are things in the film that... And that made it even more interesting, in a way. Um, the score is really interesting and kind of low at times, and that the sound design is very interesting. There's lots of... And some of the tension was actually really well built up, and I was really getting engaged in this kind of <clears throat> slowly building passive aggressiveness between Martin and the the homeowners who had kind of, you know, the second homeowners who had bought the house that he used to live in. And they, they get into the, these quarrels about how he's parking outside their house and stuff and they want him to stop doing it. And, you know, um, the way the tension keeps building and then there's a side plot with uh, some young kids in the film and there's kind of a little bit of a romance there and perhaps not even a love triangle, but there's like a... Uh, no, no, core. Oh my God, of course it's not a love triangle <laughs> because it's a, it's a young guy, his sister, and then another guy who's going out with his sister. Definitely not a love triangle, but there's like a there's a conflict there between the three of them. Uh, the young barmaid I thought was a really memorable character. There's some really funny moments in the film without it trying to be funny. I think just uh, it felt very authentic, even if the acting sometimes isn't up to scratch. There's some really authentic and raw pieces of acting and. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this film, but it's such a strange one, and I don't know how I feel about it at the same time. And I'll say there's a moment in the film, losing my voice, it's very late, where I, I literally was so frustrated with what had just happened that I just slapped myself on the leg, which I usually do when I'm really frustrated playing a video game or something. And, and Connie looked at me like, what the, f what the fuck are you doing? Like, And I was like, well, this thing happened, and you know, this, this fucking guy, and... I was trying to explain it to her, and she's like, why are you getting so aggressive? And I was like, sorry, I had to calm down, because there's something that happened in the film where I was just like, for fuck's sake, like, you know, and it's rare that I get that into a story. But then again, I don't think I was that into the story as a whole. It was just this one moment that was so frustrating and kind of heartbreaking, you know. Um, but then the final scene, it didn't really hit me emotionally, uh, even though I was clearly very into it, you know, but it, so it was a weird one for me, I don't know. Also, the film ends the same way it begins. Um, the, the opening scene of the film is the final scene of the film, which is pretty clear because the opening scene of the film ends with the title card, bait, and then it says, before, so you know that we're flashing back. So it, the film's very upfront about the way it structures itself, um, apart from the kind of flash cuts of flash forwards and flashbacks. But... You know, the opening scene, you have no context of what these characters are doing in the scene. And then at the end of the film, you know the context, you know the relationships, you know what this scene means now. And so that was, I liked that, that was that was good. But some of the close-ups are just gorgeous. And there's something about the way this film looks at times. Um, but I was going to say, uh, the film looks scratchy and ropey at times and inconsistent and um, poor quality, perhaps. But there, there's still a quality to it that's interesting, but also... Um, I did get lost in the story and the gimmick of this being, you know, 16mm hand cranked film and all that started to dissipate somewhat. And not to a point where it became irrelevant, but uh, I think if you watch this film and all you're thinking of throughout the entire film is the technical aspects of it, then maybe it's not doing its job as well uh, narratively. 
so I was, I was kind of glad halfway through the film, I was like, oh, I'm not really completely conscious of this. I'm actually getting wrapped up in the story a little bit. This is good. So I, I feel like this film will reward repeat viewings. Um, I'm very glad I bought the Blu-ray, I have to say. Um, for a film like this, you need to get it in the best possible quality. So as far as this um, DVD disc is concerned, um, it can go in the fucking bin. Oh, that, <laughs> that's a Blu-ray of The Brothers Bloom that I just watched recently. So the DVD copy here of um, Bait can pretty much just go in the garbage, so I'll never be watching that. But uh, you know, you need to see this in the best possible quality. I think it's the, it's only true and right to the film itself. Um, there's probably a lot more I could say about Bates. I feel like I could follow this up and, and do more, and I think no one would be interested whatsoever. I think that uh, Graham over at Man V Film has it right with his reviews, which are very succinct, four, five, six minutes long. He's able to sell you on the idea of this, not go into too much detail, and you can kind of... Uh, move on with your life, but of course I have to make these ridiculous 30 plus minute videos, but yeah, uh, it, I, I felt like I would love it more, uh, and I think I'll get there in repeat viewings, because certainly there's things that flash forward that you'll now clue into when you watch it a second time, I think, and maybe watching it with the commentary will kind of help that too, but in today's day and age where, you know, uh, did I just say in today's day and age, in this day and age, today. Uh, it's kind of crazy that a film like this exists and was made and was, was financed, you know, and uh, it's certainly a batshit crazy idea of how to make a film um, in our kind of modern era where people are making films on iPhones now. And he was describing his next project in the Q&A, which sounds fantastic. So I'm, I'm definitely all in on what Mark Jenkin does next. And uh, again, very glad to have bought the Blu-ray. So conquering my collection, this was an instant one to check out as soon as it came through the letterbox today, uh, or yesterday now, as we're in the early hours of the morning. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to checking out the short films that he made in, in a similar style. Uh, there's a few of them, there's three there, I think. And uh, yeah, so a very, very good Blu-ray release. The Q&A is actually on YouTube, so you can check that out if you... Uh, if you've seen the film and don't have the Blu-ray, perhaps, so the q and is, is a pretty good Q&A. He really goes into the film and stuff, and uh, he seems like a cool guy, the director. So I'll, I'll leave it there, I think, uh, <laughs> as much as I want to keep talking about it. Um, overall, it's a thumbs up from me. Um, but I, li I like that it's not a slam dunk. I like that I feel like I need to wrestle with this film a little bit more. I need to, um, you know, contend with it a bit more. And... Uh, and dive in deeper at some point in the future, no pun intended. So thank you for watching. If you've seen the film, let me know what you thought. Um, and uh, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, it's all right by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans and calling into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool. <laughs> but he's not quite as cool as you, because...